around something. We have a lot of reverb and echo from people on the live stream are asking that we can hear. Um, we think one of the reasons is that the speakers from the, the front, they, they are predict, they're predicting inwards. At the front, people will be able to hear. So we kind of scrub the front row speakers and project the audience. Sorry, in front of the camera. Yes. No, no, no. You propose it. Best thing we can suggest right now is that you turn down the speakers. <laughs> 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 Facebook and social media, it doesn't. It doesn't. So I don't know what's going on with that. So I use the same link. And then 
Is the portal is working on updating that page. Instead of the Oh, I just made it slower. Okay, that's what. Yeah. 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 Yeah
bad introduction. That was awesome. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, and thanks so much for coming. It's amazing to see 250 people here. And um, I especially uh, want to thank all the significant others for coming along. Thanks for joining your partner on this, on this journey. And you're very welcome, and feel free to join any events that your partner is invited to this week. Now, I want to talk um, about a few things. I want to talk about why we're having this summit. How, and then the meeting is going to talk about how we got started. And we're going to contest that from when we graduated from Y Combinator. We're going to talk about our current challenges, and Eric is going to talk about solutions to that. We're going to talk about what we, where we want to go in 2018, and it's going to be on. We're going to talk about what's on the horizon of 2020, about our vision and, vision and mission, and Barbie's going to help with that. And we're going to discuss a challenge that I might pose. So, why are we having some It's to get to know each other outside of work. We interact with each other, we see each other's chat messages, the comments, we do video calls, but we have a culture of directness, so it's not always a pleasant message that is brought to you. And it helps if you have a bit of, that you get to know the person on the other side. You, you establish your credibility with each other, and that's what this summit is for. And when we had the first summit in Serbia, we were kind of jokingly referring to it as a GitLab summit because it was just a few of us. But over the years that closed, and uh, the Mountain View during YC was a three month summit. It was a bit too long to be together living in the same house for that amount of time. I think everyone was relieved to go back home. And people decided they only wanted to work remote from that time on. But there is a good time. There, there is an ideal time. The right. ideal time is about a week. And uh, the next summit in Amsterdam was great. Um, Chad, the announcement, the person that our, our CRO and the person who announced me said Amsterdam was great because we get to roam around in the city, and that was awesome. Austin was great because we grew so much. Uh, it was a bit impractical from time to time, all these different places. We had to group people in because we weren't expecting that big of a crowd. In the last summit, including many of you have, have joined us there, is also by the sea or the very scenic location. And I hope this year uh, we'll have a great summit again. Uh, I used to be nervous. It won't be as good as the last one, but I, I think I've left that nervousness behind. Uh, it's getting better every single time. So now I want to invite Dimitri on stage to tell how it GitLab got started, so please welcome the original author of GitLab, my co-founder and our CTO, Dimitri. Let me see. Uh, hi everyone. I'm going to tell you a story about the early days of GitLab. I have a quite long and strong connection with project and the company, and I want to share it with you. I think the story is the best way to do it. So, how does this start? Yeah. I was working as a software developer uh, in an outsourcing company. Uh, I had a degree, a faculty degree in car engineering uh, for the moment here started. But I like software development more than fixing cars. So, here I am working uh, in a software company. Uh, in the meantime, I was living in a small house. Uh, Near the countryside. It was a really old house and like some basic things like running water. So every morning I get two empty buckets, go to the public well, get some water for cooking, for washing. Uh, yeah, but it was not my main problem back then. My main problem back then was cost costing. Uh, I was not satisfied with uh, available self hosted tools on the market. Uh, I used github.com for open source project and it worked really well. And then in a day-to-day -day work in the company, when I uh, used other tools that were installed in the company, uh, I really suffered uh, from user experience, from lack of features, 
if you talk to them, the set of the important you online, I actually downloaded and did it offline. Uh, uh, okay. I don't know what I There was one co worker who understood my problem. Uh, his name is Valerius Sizzolt, and he is now working in GitLab. Uh, I and Valeri usually have a, a coffee break during a uh, work day where we discuss uh, different topics around tech development. One day we uh, have a conversation about the uh, costing tools. And we were wondering if it's really that hard to build a web interface for story management. Um, and by the end of the conversation, uh, we were 100% sure we are going to build it. So, challenge accepted. Uh, we work during evenings and weekends because we had no daily job. Uh, we were Rails programmers back then, and since we built Rails, you can prototype really fast. So the initial version was ready in a month. Um, we decided to open source it, uh, because we wanted other people also to use it and modify according to their needs. I even made a static website for it and shared it with Ruby community. It helped us really well in a way of promotion and bringing new contributors right into the week. Because it was a hobby, we didn't plan to build a company or something big out of it. Uh, I continued with my daily job. It was totally fine for me. Uh, Valeri focused on his family. But because of few contributors, uh, I Safe is for a project for a bit longer. I was really surprised when in a few months more than 50 people contributed to the project. A few months later, Brightbox Austin offered me a free server for different development. I used this server uh, to develop GitLab. Uh, and you might know it right now as GitLab.org. Because I used GitLab to develop GitLab, I actually was uh, encouraged to improve it every time. Uh, so I kept working on the project. Uh, I did release every month, the 22nd. The date was a random week, uh, but the month was uh, monthly schedule was in purple. I realized it's more than a copy to me. The company where I worked uh, work for started using GitLab. Some of my friends started using GitLab in their companies too. In the meantime, I get an email from Sid. Uh, he said that he admires GitLab and its quality. And he sent me for I merged his contributions really fast. Uh, I did it in one day. He also said that he is going to build a SaaS uh, software as a service uh, business based on GitLab. Because of his honesty and because he actually contributed to the project, uh, I was really inspired by his idea. I didn't ask for money or anything. I said, yeah, keep up. I also started another project uh, back then. It was GitLab CI. Uh, the idea of the project was to run tests for GitLab. So by the end of 2012, I have had two projects to maintain. But there was also a downside. Uh, there were more and more contributions, more and more users more and more issues. GitLab uh, took 
much more of my time. And it was really hard to combine with my daily job. And instead, uh, in, in order to focus on ASIC GitLab, uh, uh, on uh, and as, uh, my full time job, yeah, I need to choose. Uh, I really like to work on GitLab, but then I need a sustainable income. So I tried to make money with GitLab. First, I started with donations. I often reference to it as ice cream money. Uh, it didn't work well. In the best months, it was less than $100. I also tried to install and update GitLab for other users. But there was a conflict there. Uh, the, in order to make money on installation and update process, you need to uh, make it actually painful and uh, not efficient. And instead, I focused on improving installation and update pro uh, process in GitLab. So I totally failed uh, in my goal to make uh, any reasonable amount of money with GitLab. One day, I was really, really tired. And I opened Twitter, uh, I read a tweet, I want to work on GitLab full time. I didn't expect any outcome of it. Uh, but a few hours, maybe later, uh, Sid contacted me. And he proposed me to pay a salary. Uh, in order to work full time on GitLab and help him with his software as a service version, GitLab.com. I was really, really happy uh, with the offer, but there was a risk of leaving a well paid job. So I asked him for an upfront payment. And because we didn't have any contracts, I asked him to send money with Western Union. And it really happened. So Sid sent money to some stranger from Ukraine he met over the internet. It's like classic fraud. <laughs> uh, yeah. So since January 2013, I started working on GitLab full time. It was a team of three people, uh, me, Sid, and Marin. But Sid and Marin also work for other companies, so they can earn money uh, to pay me a salary and cover infrastructure costs. Still, we shipped much, much faster. Every next release was bigger than the previous one. By that time, there was only one problem. We never met in person. We worked fully remote. And she decided to fix that. Uh, there was a conference, Rails conference in Poland, and it looked like a good opportunity for us. So I bought a plane ticket. Uh, I got my visa. It was my first international flight. It was my first flight <laughs> at all. <laughs> so I fly to Poland, Krakow. And we agreed to meet at Airbnb place. And my flight was in late evening. So I arrived uh, to the city almost by midnight. I was quite surprised when I reached the place and I haven't seen Sid or Marin there. There were some strangers. <laughs> uh, and then a few minutes later, I got a call from Sid. But before I can uh, hear anything more than hate B3, I run out of money on my prepaid phone. So I was in the foreign country at the midnight uh, in some living district, without smartphone, without Google Maps. Uh, I started walking by empty, dark street toward directions that's supposed to be a city center. My main goal was to find a taxi. And luckily, I found one. The bad thing is that driver didn't speak English. 
neither he understand word hotel. Uh, so here am I looking for some people who can actually uh, help me communicate with a taxi driver. Luckily, I found a young couple. Uh, they explained taxi driver what I actually want, and it was uh, get to closest hotel. So in few, yeah, like in 20 minutes, I'm in the hotel. Uh, I rent a room. First thing I do, I connect to wireless network. After it, I get a bunch of message from uh, Sid and Marin. It appears that Airbnb address changed in the last minute, and they tried to inform me up front, but because I was already in the uh, plane, I didn't know it. And they told me a new address and uh, asked me to come to them. Uh, but I said, no, <laughs> I'm staying in the hotel. Enough of adventure for me. So instead, Marin and Karen took a taxi and drive to hotel. Uh, Karen stayed in the car, so driver does not uh, leave. And Marin was trying to convince me to uh, come with him. Yeah. Finally, I agreed. And by probably 1 AM, we finally all met in person in the Airbnb place. Um, yeah, the rest of the trip went fine. Uh, but we, it was my first time when we actually met in person. Uh, mm, time to change, yeah. So a uh, year passed. Uh, we grew into the team of eight people. We tried to make money in self-hosted market by selling support and consultancy. I think it didn't work well for us. At a certain point, we introduced Enterprise Edition. We added it as an extra option to support, but it quickly became our main selling point. We wanted GitLab to be a leader in self-hosted market. So we were really surprised when we lost our first customer. It appears to be the higher manager uh, of that company didn't know about GitLab at all, so didn't consider it as an option when uh, he bought a software for the whole company. At this point, we realize that we have a problem with awareness, and we need to do something with it. Sid had an idea. It's Y Combinator. It was a different story, own story but he will tell you how radically it changed the company for us. Thank you. You might be wondering why I'm wearing a lab coat. Um, when, we, when I started uh, GitLab.com, uh, I wanted to make sure that people would remember uh, the presentation, so I figured why not dress as a laboratorian. And it worked. I, I recently got someone that came back from Amsterdam.rb and said, look, when you were dressed like that and presenting GitLab.com, I think you were ridiculous. That market was already divided up. I didn't think GitLab would stand a chance. And now the same person was, uh, is sending an application. So that was, that was great news. And uh, we'll, I want to make sure you remember this presentation too. So I got it out of the closet again. And it has all the different events I went to in the beginning of GitLab. Now, I want to change to the next slide. I have to press two times to do that. We've made a lot of progress since leaving YC. One of the most important things, changing our logo, because the old one gave people nightmares. And we don't want to be responsible for that. And that actually, that change happened on demo day after the day we graduated from YC and we met the old contributor. Um, another thing that happened is that we grew our team by a lot of people and we'll keep growing. And it's really encouraging that the statistics are now saying that two thirds of the people that self-host Git are using GitLab. 
So most enterprises self-host, so most enterprises are using GitLab currently. Another encouraging thing has been the Forrester Wave survey. It's the first time we engage with an analyst firm that helps enterprises decide on what to be. And we're really, really excited that they choose GitLab CI to be the leader in the market. We have the best strategy, we have the best product. And we've shown that we're not just version control. We can do other things, and those things can be the best of breed. They can be the best in the market. That's because we're not doing it with just our team members here. We're doing it with a wider community. We have over 100,000 organizations using GitLab, and they contribute. Now, it's not all roses. We have some challenges. These three things, which I'll go into, I think are the biggest challenges of GitLab at the moment. One of them is that the clicker doesn't work. <laughs> GitLab reliability is not where it needs to be. People are a fan of GitLab. They really want to use it, but we're letting them down. GitLab.com is not as, as available as it is, as it needs to be, and we have to turn that around. And I want to welcome Eric to the stage. Eric is our new Vice President of Engineering, and he's going to explain what's wrong and what he's uh, going to work on with his team to do it. Please welcome Eric. No? Yes. Oh, there it is. Well, first, I just want to say it's, uh, it's been a wonderful month of onboarding. Everybody's been so generous with their time, so thank you for that. Um, I feel grateful to be here in, Gre uh, in Greece and get the chance to meet you all face to face. I can't wait to dive in and start uh, working on, on solving some hard problems, because that's what I like to do. And this is an interesting one. So um, GitLab.com reliability. Um, as Sid said, it's not where you want it to be. To quantify that, it means we've got about two nines of availability. And for companies to build on us, and to trust us, that's not good enough. So Sid has put a goal in front of us of um, make GitLab.com suitable for mission-critical workloads. And that means we're targeting three nines, 99.95% availability. That's the SLA of our underlying infrastructure providers, and we want to peg ourselves to that. And if we reach it, maybe there's a way we can be even better. Um, how we're going to do that is a mixture of people, process, and technology. Uh, so first, in the short term, we're going to get prepared to do things that don't scale. At a startup, obviously, think about automation and, and exponential growth curves. But um, sometimes you have to do things that don't scale, and that's a good thing as long as you have a plan to automate things later. Uh, but in the meantime, we're going to get our hands dirty. Um, on the longer term, we're going to focus on tighter collaboration. We're going to um, allow the scale of GitLab.com to better inform the features that are being developed for the enterprise product as well as for the community edition. Um, and we're going to fix our infrastructure issues, and we're going to adopt some new technologies along the way. So uh, people, um, again, in the short term, it's, it's all hands on deck. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to use uh, some brute force approaches to improve liability. Um, in the longer term, uh, we're going to take our production team today and get them entirely focused on automation. This pie chart kind of represents the time split that would be ideal for them. We want 60% um, of their time focused on automation, 25% um, on go forward features that are in the application, and uh, as well as 15% on firefighting uh, with issues. Um, you want our build and production teams that are currently separate today um, to start working together even more closely. Because what they do while the technologies are different is so similar in character, we think they're going to benefit from sharing techniques and sharing, uh, sharing code. Um, and lastly, um, we want the back-end teams, the one creating the features, to be the ones shipping their code and ultimately pressing the deploy button to GitLab.com. I think I got it working now. Um, I think so. So uh, better process. Um, again, in the short term, uh, our new quality department is working on uh, what's going to be our brute force approach to solving reliability. Um, in the longer term, um, I want to add a process where we start demoing more. The first tenet of the Agile Manifesto is that working software is the best measure of progress. So I'm a big believer in this ritual. 
Are you okay? I'm Okay. Um, so I'll put the mic. Testing? Okay. Um, so working software is the best measure of progress. That means I want to start demoing regularly. Um, I promise you the first time we do this, we won't like it. But uh, a couple projects in, you'll become addicted to this process and you're going to like it. When you've done everything right, it does feel like it's unnecessary, but we do it regularly anyway, and it helps us solve problems that we didn't even know we were looking for by getting more eyes on the project. Um, continuous delivery. So this is how we're going to allow the um, stress that GitLab.com is under due to its traffic to better uh, inform the features that we're delivering. Um, and then we're going to figure out how we collaborate with our new teams. We've got new functional teams for security and for quality, and we're going to figure out that, that working relationship. We've got pictures up here of our new team members, Kathy, who's heading up security, and BJ, who's uh, heading up our, our quality function. And then lastly, the, the technology. So we're going to be moving GitLab.com to Google Cloud Platform, a new infrastructure as a service provider. Um, the top capabilities that we need to start are multiple pristine environments. Uh, we also need a continuous delivery pipeline that threads through those environments so we can deploy code early and often and with confidence. Um, the technologies that are dictated by those two capabilities are we're going to containerize everything in our application, we're going to orchestrate those containers with Kubernetes, um, and then we're going to adopt as much open source components as we can and then write custom tools for what doesn't exist out there and probably do that in Go. Um, and this will be the first iteration, and there's a question of can we pack in more into this first iteration? We're going to figure that out this week. Um, but we're going to launch that, and then we're going to keep iterating, and eventually we'll get towards our ideal infrastructure, our ideal system. Um, so that's it. Uh, I look forward to diving in with you this week and, uh, and really crystallizing this project and, and hopefully leaving the summit with, uh, with a plan and then kicking it off as soon as we get home. So thanks. Yes, I did. So thank you, Eric. Um, I want to point to another challenge that we have. For our, uh, the third quarter, we had a great result. We did 90 The Q4 forecast is uh, for incremental ACV, so the additional recurring revenue we'll generate is uh, going to be 72% of plan. And that's not enough. We want to get to 99. We want to get to 100%. So you can help by uh, creating leads, like help if you know a company using GitLab already, inform the salespeople by shipping a great EEP product. So these are some issues that our customers really want to see, and we have to get them right, and we have to get them out in the planned releases, and to help in bring orders from future quarters. So if sales need your help with, with a support issue, with a feature discussion, please, please do help them. Next slide, please. And the first thing I want to highlight that we absolutely have to get is GitLab Geo. GitLab Geo is the biggest one from our customers. We wanted ourselves to move to uh, Google Cloud. So this is essential to get done. If we don't get it done, this year, we'll even have a revenue recognition problem because we promised this feature this year to our customers. So this is the feature we have to ship. And every day, we can, make, we can win. Every hour, we can win. Every week, we can win. Makes it better. So we cannot afford a delay here. Also want to talk a bit about where we're going next year. I want to talk about our product vision, our sales targets, and the big bets we'll be making. So the product vision, I think this user said it really well. GitLab is growing, and, and we're growing with some of our users. We started as just version control, version control and CI, and we're, we're helping them to, to go on this journey of, of continuous uh, delivery. And to tell you more about the product vision, I want to invite on stage our VP of product, Jok.
So, and halfway through the year, we said, so we announced this in summer of 2016. We said, this is our master plan. Developers should be able to do whatever they need to do inside of GitLab. And then in December, so what are we going to do next? In 2018, we will ship the DevOps lifecycle within GitLab. So this is how it looks nowadays. Have a thing that you, that's called DevOps tools. And what it comes down to, what it, oh, this is much louder. Um, and I think the image here is, is really applicable, right? Traditional DevOps tools is just trying to duct tape together these developer tools and these ops tools, and often by third party tools. It's, it's not a single experience. I think this is a really good way to see it. DevOps tools is the overlap between dev and ops. And as you know, today GitLab does already a very good job on the left side. We cover the entire circle. So what we're going to do in 2018 is we're going to ship complete DevOps, all the way from development to all the way to operations and everything in between. So why are we doing this? Well, when we shipped our, our master plan, when we included CI, we said, you know, if you have a single interface, if you have a single permission model, everything becomes much easier. And the same goes for the complete DevOps cycle. So you, you don't have to manage multiple applications, you don't have to manage many permissions, you have a single UI, and get these unique benefits because everything is in the same place. It makes so much sense. And I often wonder why no one else is doing it, but no one else is doing it. And this is why this is so exciting. And I think the best way to describe is to think about a typical use case, right? So if you're an engineer and you started an organization, it's very common that you spend like the first week or sometimes the first months or sometimes your entire internship, which I've heard before, just setting up the development environment for the stuff you're going to work on. It's painful and it takes a very long time. And what we want to achieve is that, let's say Sally starts the company, she sits down, she opens GitLab, there's the GitLab IDE. She doesn't have to install anything, she just makes her commits right there, creates a merge request, that merge request gets tested. The result of that merge request gets automatically pushed all the way to staging, pre-production, and the results of that are monitored, everything is auto-scaled, if it's deployed and there are errors, it's automatically rolled back. There's so much power here and there's so much to win here. And uh, I'm, I'm going to go through the features for a bit, but I think we should talk a little bit about like, why is this important? And when you look at, when you ask developers and you ask organizations that build software, what is important to you? They no name a number of things, right? They name, we have to increase the automation of this whole cycle. We need more cloud-based development tools because it's a pain to set up everything locally and you end up wasting a lot of time. You want to be able to actually measure the effect of all the things that you're doing on your customers. It's incredibly important. And lastly, you want to speed up the release cycle time. And so this was collected by the same people that called us the leader in CI. Um, and when you look at this and you start thinking about it, you think, hey, wait, there's a particular order to this. And in fact, it seems that these are dependent on each other. Uh, and I'm going to walk you through them. First off, customer experience. I think there's almost nothing more important than customer experience. And it is software today that makes or breaks customer experience. The way I think about it is that when I choose a bank, and I recently had to do this, I went for the bank with the best software experience, the best mobile app, the best web interface. Because if you don't have that, it just, it just doesn't feel good. But there's nothing more important than this. And if you're a large organization and you want to make sure that this is good, you have to focus on the software. So to be able to 
create a great customer experience and to, shop, sh to ship great software, you have to speed up the release cycle time. Because what happens is that, as Wayne Gretzky says, the puck is moving, and you should go to where the puck is going to be, and not where it is now. And if you have a very long release cycle time, that means that you end up going to the wrong place, and the puck has already moved. Your goal has already moved where you want to be. So the shorter the cycle is, the more flexible you can be, and the closer you get to that goal, and the faster you can get to that goal. So how do you speed up the release cycle time? Well, you do that by automating more, right? The more you automate, the less time you have to spend in each individual step. And when you think about, well, how do you automate all these steps in developing, deploying, monitoring, scaling, managing software and infrastructure, well, there's only one way nowadays, and that's by going cloud native. And this is what we're going to try to do. Well, this is what we're going to do in 2018, all with GitLab. So we go, we help you by monitoring your customer experience, we're speeding up your cycle time, we'll automate all the, help you automate all the steps, and we all do it cloud native. All right, let's talk about how we're going to do that. I'm going to walk through the different steps in the cycle, and I'm going to talk to you about some of the things that we're going to do. And of course, this is not comprehensive. We're going to do much more than this. Things are going to look different, but I think this gives us a very good idea of what it's going to look like. So we start with plan. One of the coolest things, and I think one thing that we all appreciate about something like Google Docs is the ability to collaborate in real time. It's incredibly important that you can quickly iterate on things, and you can do this in real time so that you're not in each other's way, you're never waiting for someone else, you're not blocking another way. So we're shipping this in issues and merge requests. So you can just work together there very easily. Next is we're going to start working on portfolio management. In other ways, how can you manage multiple projects, complex projects from a higher level? And the first thing we're going to ship in this is Epics, and we're going to ship it real soon in 10.2. Uh, and there's going to be much more following this. And I, I know that this is a very highly requested feature, so I'm looking forward to it. All right, there we go. So, and then once you have epics, you can plot them over time, and you can actually have a look. Hey, look at this. This is an actual roadmap we have now. So one of the features that we're going to build is roadmap, so you can see what is happening over time. All right, so much for planning. So there's a lot of features here. I just highlighted two quick ones. Let's get into create. And, it's getting more and more excited the further we get into this, I think. We're working on a multi-file editor. Today, if you want to make changes in the interface, you can only do one file, and then you have to commit that file. And we already have, right now, on everyone that's running the latest version of GitLab, a multi-file editor running. It's hidden by any cookie, but we're hoping to release it soon. But going from there, what is the next step? And if you think back about the example that I gave about Sally, is an actual web IDE. So this means not just being able to edit multiple files at the same time, but also being able to have your development environment running entirely in GitLab and seeing a live preview of that. So just imagine that all you need to do, if you want to edit the website, you just press edit, and you have there an entire environment. And you change things, you see the update immediately. And you can do this on the day that you, like, Five minutes after you opened your new laptop. I, 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 I think this is super exciting. This will make everything much easier. And then, if you have a new project, you don't want to think about it. Like, we want to remove thresholds. We want to remove steps. So why do you still have to create a project? Why do you even have to bother going to GitLab? Why not just push a project? So we'll allow you to create a project simply by pushing your new project. All right. Next to verify, there's a whole lot in here as well, and this is one of the areas that we've been expanding rapidly, and I think we've proven that we're very good at, but we can definitely add more. So we, will, we already have in GitLab the ability to see your code quality, and what we'll add to this is the ability to check for licenses. For enterprises, it's incredibly important to make sure that whatever you have in your repository doesn't contain a license that is not allowed. You can get in very big problems. You want to catch this the earliest moment. And there's no earlier moment than the moment you actually create a merge request. All right. Next, you have CI, right? So you're testing your project. You have made sure that the licenses are correct and that the code quality doesn't degrade. Well, 
what is what remains? You want to make sure your performance, your your application is performant, that it's fast, and it doesn't get slower when you introduce new changes. And you want to make sure that it's secure, something that I think we're all very aware of today. So with the actual change, or before it's even live in production or even in staging, we'll give you an insight of how your changes affected the performance of your application and even the security. And if you have flaky tests, which can happen, we'll, we'll highlight them for you so you can pay some more attention to them. All right, let's talk about packaging. This is one of those things that I think many people are going to love. There's many organizations today that work with large binary files, be it to deploy their projects or to ship particular, like for instance, Java um, organizations that use a lot of Java, they have a big need for something like binary repositories. So we'll allow you to have a binary repository in each project inside of GitLab. And when we're thinking about releasing, and I think this is where it gets really exciting, we're building on top of Kubernetes. And building on top of Kubernetes means we can do these amazing things in relationship to clusters. Now we'll start talking about that nonstop from now on. And I think the first one is the idea of an incremental rollout, right? So traditionally, if you even have set up a system like this where you do an incremental rollout, it happens somewhere on the terminal of someone's computer or somewhere on a server. And what we're going to do in GitLab, we're just going to show you in the application how your changes are being rolled out. And then the cool thing here is, is that if the error rate is too high, we're just going to roll it back. And we're going to do that all automatically and visualized, of course, inside of GitLab. So just imagine that, right? You make a mistake. It somehow ends up in production. The error rate is too high. It just rolls it back automatically and it notifies you. I, th I think that's amazing. It's so much work that is taken away from you by GitLab. And this is the same thing, automatic rollback. So let's say you have a merge request that was merged and that introduced or that raised the error rate. We're just going to show you right there where you made the change, that your change increased the error rate. So you know what exactly, which piece of code made your application less stable and actually caused GitLab to say, hey, we should roll this back. And then if we're talking about all of this, where, where does your code go? It goes through your cluster, right? So there should be your first class support for clusters. So right from GitLab, you'll be able to create your own clusters and you'll be able to have your own Kubernetes cluster where then your review apps will run, your CI will run, your staging, pre-production, production environments will run. No more jumping into, you know, half-baked web apps that are made only to be seen by, you know, whoever knows very well about it. No, everyone can now just look into GitLab and say, hey, this is what kind of cluster we have running. And this is how we can manage it. And in fact, if you have clusters, you want to be able to monitor them. So we're going to add cluster monitoring so that you have your cluster and if something goes wrong or you suspect something is wrong, you can just see it right there in GitLab. It's an incredibly powerful idea. And I think this is one of those places where we're bringing the whole operation side that normally lives in like a black box, at least from the perspective of the developer, it's now right there in GitLab for anyone to see, for anyone to have access to. You don't have to ask your colleague anymore, to say, hey, is something wrong with it? Cluster? No, it's, it's right there. And then, now that you're releasing very often, right? Because this is one of the things that we want to do. You want to speed it up because we automate more. We should give you a model to easily release and merge many things at the time and to make sure that whatever you're merging is actually the right thing. So by allowing you to test the result of the merge, we have a new problem. And the problem is that you get merge requests that constantly have to rerun, and you would put a lot of resources. And release train solved this problem. Now, I'm not going to go into the weeds of explaining this, but it's very awesome. Uh, clicker. There we go. And then, you know, when you have all of this, you can do a lot of, lot of cool things. For instance, if you look at your project, you can see all your pipelines. You can see what is running, what particular change is running in what particular environment. You could even pick one up and drag them to another environment just to deploy it. So just like moving a cart on issue boards from one stage to the next, from one label to the next, you can now just say, well, oh, this particular change I now want to see in pre-production because it worked fine in staging. Let's talk about configure. 
So you have your application running, now a lot of traffic is coming in, you want to scale it up. Well, we have the connection with Kubernetes, we have your cluster running there, and it's being monitored there. So from GitLab, you'll be able to say, I want to scale my cluster up, I want to scale my application up and, and use more containers, for instance. And we can say, tell you to do that in GitLab, but most of us spend half of our day in Slack, so why not just allow you to do that through Slack? So today we have quite some tools already to allow you to create issues from chat and to you know, look at particular issues, and we'll go much further than this and say, you can now manage most of your cluster of almost any of your operations straight from chat. And chat can report back to you and say, this is what is going on in your clusters and in your applications. I really want to click. All right, last step, monitoring. So as you know, we've been working for a very long time on monitoring, in particular with Prometheus. And we, we can do some cool things there, right? We can show you application metrics. Um, but we, what we can't do, you, do yet is show you how a particular request goes through your entire application stack. And with tracing, we can finally do that. So what you can do is you can instrument your application so that you can see exactly where a lot of time is spent. So you can find, for instance, performance problems. It's a very powerful idea. And just bringing this together, I, I, it's, it's like the future. Barely anyone is doing tracing, let alone building it into their applications. And then you, you now are monitoring a whole bunch of things, right? If today you deploy using auto DevOps, you already start automatically monitoring a whole bunch of statistics about your application, about the containers that you have running. But what if something goes wrong? Should you always be staring at it? No, of course not. So using Prometheus's alerts, what we can do is that when something looks strange, when you have an aberration in your signal, we can automatically alert you and say, hey, there's something wrong here. And you'll be able to go into it and look, of course, in this, from the same place, hey, what was this? What was the code that was changed here? What affected this? And then from a higher level, you'll be able to see not only how your developers are committing. You can not only see how your projects are moving forward on issues, but you can see how your different applications are doing straight from GitLab, straight from the place where you built all the things. Now you can see how all your applications are performing and how well they're running or, or whether one of them is down. And then one thing that fascinates me is that there's a whole market of logging products. There's so many people trying to solve this problem of logging. And people like to move between applications because nothing ever fits. But with GitLab, we'll just give it to you out of the box. Don't think anymore about your logging applications. We are connected to your cluster. We know about your application. Now you have direct access to your logs as well. And then, uh, oh, oh, no, no. <laughs> it's really, yeah, please move it, Ernst. I pressed, I pressed the same button. And this is like literally my favorite feature. So I, it's really, really disappointing that now we have to wait. OK, there it is. All right. Loading. Thank you very much, Aaron. So I started talking about customer experience. How important is it to modern organizations to focus on customer experience and to make sure that that is good? And how you can achieve that through automating and shortening the cycle. And you do that through adopting cloud native. And we're starting to build GitLab around that idea. But how do you actually know whether customer experience is being improved? By monitoring it. And why not monitor it in the same place that you have all your other stuff? So what we will allow you to do is to send your business metrics straight to GitLab using Prometheus. So that means that you can see if you make a particular change, for instance, you change the color of your home page, you can directly see in the merge request that you made that change, whether that has affected sales, whether that has affected customer interactions. So you directly combine code with the end result of that. And I think that's one of the most powerful things that you can possibly do. To me, that is the future of shipping software, directly seeing the result of, 
of what you did. So if you are just a developer, you're starting new in a company, you open your laptop for the first time, you make your commit, and within five minutes, you can see how your first change affects the performance of the business. I mean, that's the future. And we're doing it 2018. So using GitLab, we will help organizations worldwide adopt complete DevOps and help them achieve a higher customer satisfaction. And I think Sid is going to tell next about what we're going to do after that. Thank you. Thank you, Job, for presenting that. I want to talk about um, our, goal, our other goals for next year. And it's not just product. We also want to keep growing. We did really, we're going to do really well this year. We did really well the two years before. But we have to keep that going. So our compound annual growth rate, our average growth has been 178%. That means that year over year, you're becoming 2.7 times larger in, in annual recurring revenue. And we want to keep that going. Now, the other thing that we're going to do in 2018 are some big bets. And big bets are things that align with our vision, but that will take us into new markets. Can I get the next slide, please? We're going to do four big bets. The first one is a security scan. The security scan means that we now, we now have GitLab with Auto DevOps. It builds your code, it tests your code, makes sure your code quality is OK. There's one missing thing, my code secure. So we're going to bundle open source and closed source tools into GitLab that will automatically test your code, test your review app. The second bet is integrated DevOps. You see it today. We're going from just Dev to Ops, and we're going to start new to two new teams, a packaging team and a configuration team. The other two bets are even more ambitious. We're going to do, uh, we're considering doing a peer education company. We want to make sure that everyone can contribute. Right now, there are million developers in the world. There could be many more, but there's very few people who can spend the three years it takes to become a developer, can live without income during that time. So we're going to see whether we can augment their income during that time while they're learning. The fourth one is complete biz ops. We, we're revolutionizing the DevOps lifecycle. But a company doesn't need to only create a product. It also needs to sell it. And with marketing and sales, there's the same problem as with GitLab, uh, as, as in the market for Git, GitLab before GitLab came there. There is a lot of tools around there, but it's your work to integrate all of them. We think we can do better. We think we can give an open source integration out of the box between the tools to load data, to visualize them, and to take action on them. So moving beyond 2018 to 2020, what's on the horizon? 2020 is the date we want to IPO. But there's some other things that I think we should realize. And I want to start with the Rails Girls vision. Uh, I went to a Rails Girls event a couple of months ago. And that's teaching people how to learn to program. And on the, on the day we, we, uh, we had the assignment, on the Saturday, a student came to me with a Windows laptop and said, excuse me for bringing this. Because she was told that her Windows laptop caused all kinds of program, problems learning uh, Ruby. And I think that's not the world we should live in. It shouldn't be about what kind of machine you have. It shouldn't be about you have to get a MacBook, otherwise you can't program. Next slide, please. It's not only about like Windows versus Mac or Linux. It's also about PC versus mobile. People are moving to tablets. People are moving to mobile phones. So I'm very encouraged that our uh, web IDE will be available on tablets and maybe in the future on mobile as well. Now, beyond 2020, I want to remind everyone what our vision and mission are. 
And to kick that off, I want to welcome on stage Barbie, our Chief Culture Officer. Barbie, welcome to the stage. It's great to be here. For those of you I haven't met yet, it's great to meet you here on stage at the GitLab Summit for 2017. So I do think that um, a great people make a great company, but I also think that what's great about GitLab is not only do we have an amazing product that enables software development across the world from wherever you are at, but we're able to do our jobs from wherever we are at. And that is one of the primary reasons that I actually joined GitLab. I was excited about the technology. I was excited about what we're doing and what we're enabling in this world and in the workplace, but I was also excited to be able to do it from my homes while you're at your homes, or the beach, or anywhere with an internet connection. And that's really freed me up, and I've got to tell you, in the short time that I have been at GitLab, my son's math scores have already gone up 30% because I can help him with his homework now. Never could do that before. So it's really been really fun for me to be here. And what I also think it does, it enables us to get the very best people with no limitations on where you sit or how long your commute might be or whether or not you're in a community that's a high-tech hub. We really can bring the best of high-tech and the best of software development to any place on the planet that has an internet connection. And it enables us to find the best people and to, and to have a successful career. You don't have to move to Berlin or Tel Aviv or Austin or the Silicon Valley or Seattle or Boston. You can do it from where you're at. And I, that, that thrills me. Next slide. Because I really do fundamentally believe, like I said, that great people equal a great product. And you are the reason we have a great product. So what's next? How do we build an even more robust product? How do we bring what we do to more people and to more companies? Well, we do it by expanding our workforce. And how do we do that? Again, through you, through the people that we already have here today. So I want to make this a little bit of a call to arms in that uh, we, uh, we all need to find the best people that we know. And if they're great for GitLab, we need to refer them to GitLab. We need to encourage them to consider GitLab. And we need to do it for people who are diverse. They might not look just like us. They might look very different from us. But if they have the skill set, then we need to encourage them to be here. And one of the ways that I hope to do this in 2018 for GitLab is by bringing an internship program to the company. Now, we aren't a huge company. And I don't want to be um, unbalanced with experienced talent versus very, very, very junior talent. But I do think that the talent we have here can really help to grow both GitLab's adoption from students in universities that then go into careers, but they can also help you perform your jobs and your functions by young talent who can contribute to the company. So you will see that begin to kick off in 2018 as we begin to build an internship program here. And so I'll look for you to give me advice on that. What are the best universities in your town, in your country? I might know a lot about universities in America, but I don't know as much about universities across the world. So as you have recommendations to us about the universities we should be partnering with, I want your advice on that too. So I'm on Slack, you can let me know that. But that's really one of the new things that will be happening at GitLab this year. And I want you guys all, I want all of you to understand that we all owe it to each other to help each other be better. And that comes from being amazing colleagues and doing amazing work. And we can only get there by adding more amazing people. So I'm really great to have, I'm really glad to have you on the team with me in order to do that. So with that, I will hand it back over to Sid. Thanks, Barbie. Thank you, Barbie, for that. Um, I want to highlight another thing. And uh, people have said, like, oh, I can't believe we lost the deal to Community Edition. That's, that will keep happening. Uh, community edition will always be our biggest competitor. So what we should focus on is not on making sure that GitLab C won't be our biggest competitor. It will be because we want to have an awesome open source product. What we should focus on is making sure there is no other competitors. So instead of focusing on the first line here, we should focus on all the other lines and make sure we never lose a deal to any non-GitLab competitor out there. And I think maybe we should even change this slide and not say CE will always be our biggest competitor, but CE should be the only product we lose deals to. 
I think that should be our message. Thank you. I want to uh, say something that I didn't invent. It's, it's from Amazon. It's from Jeff Bezos. And he reminds people that it's still day one. And he had three things that I think were really insightful. The first thing is you don't ship the process. So what we should care about at GitLab is we should care about our users. We should care about the contributors in the community. We should care about our customers. That's it. We should not never care about the process. So if you did the wrong thing but followed the process, if it ends up hurting a customer or a user, that's a problem. If you didn't follow the process but it ended up being great, that is great. So I know I love processes, and I love them because they make us more effective, more efficient. You don't have to ask anyone. You know what the process is. It f prevents mistake. That is why they're there. They're not there as a defense for doing the wrong thing. They're not there to hinder you if you want to do the right thing. Feel free to change them. Feel free to go around them. It's about the end result. The second thing is to embrace external trends. We should not fight but we should use them as a tailwind. And I think we did that last year when we said, look, Kubernetes, it's the biggest thing. It's a revolution from virtual machines to container schedulers, and we're using that as a tailwind. We went all in last summit, and we are all in right now. I think that's a major, major advantage. And the third thing is high-velocity decision-making. The progress of our company, you can measure it by revenue growth, but you can also measure it by how many decisions we take. The faster we take decisions, the faster we will get ahead. Just like that release cycle is important. You get the code out quickly. It's also very important to make decisions quickly. And many decisions are reversible. So you can take it and you can see what, what happens and you can reverse them if needed. So we should always optimize for speed. GitLab is not a consensus company, so you should hear everyone. Everyone should, you should let them know you heard them. But in the end, the person who is the owner takes the decision and moves forward. You don't have to wait for everyone to be aligned. I'm very glad that tomorrow we'll be hopefully not using my laptop. <laughs> A piece from our strategy uh, that I wanted to highlight. Our mission is how can everyone contribute? Or we, our mission is everyone can contribute. How can we, how and what ways can they do that? So we want them to contribute to digital products. And GitLab is reinventing the DevOps lifecycle. Want them to contribute with GitLab. So we should make sure that GitLab is as available as it can be. We should have a great CE version. We should have a great free tier on GitLab.com. And we want people to be able to contribute to GitLab. And over, over, over 1,800 people have done that. And the last thing is we want people to be able to contribute to our organization. And I'm always very encouraged when I see people sending in merge requests to our handbook. This is the sequence we defined where we came out of YC, and it's still the sequence we're, for, we're, we're sticking to today. Our first goal was to become the most popular on-premise solution for the software development lifecycle. We did that. We're there. It's two-thirds of the organizations are using us. Thank you. <laughs> now we want to become the most, we want to generate the most revenue from that. And we're very far from that. We have a long way to catch up. But every year we do that 2.7x, we're going to get closer. After that, and partly in parallel, will become the most popular SaaS for private repos. We need to fix the availability of GitLab.com. We already fixed mostly the speed of GitLab.com, and I'm very sure we can get there and become the best place because it's the best product. Then only after we've overtaken SaaS with private repos, we'll have a go at the public repository. GitHub.com is going to stay for a long time the place where people publish public software.
But if we get the revenue, we can make a better product. And then our big goal is to not just do software. It's to allow collaboration, to make a great collaboration tool for all the knowledge workers so we can change our culture from read only to read write. Now, last year at the summit, I did a challenge. I said, if we can get idea to production working with Google Container Engine, I will dance the SID shuffle. This year, I want to present a new challenge. And it's actually three different things so that everyone can contribute and not just the developers. I want to challenge us to replicate a backup of all the .com data with Geo. I want to challenge us to ship an alpha version of the web IDE, including the editor, the web terminal, and a preview screen. And I want to challenge the marketing and salespeople to record 10 training videos of objection handling, a customer having an objection and a salesperson responding to it. If we get one out of three, me and Dimitri will sing the GitLab song. If we get two out of three, me and Dimitri will sing the GitLab song while dancing the shiitake. If we get three out of three, me and Karen, I will sing the GitLab song while dancing my wedding choreography with Karen. So I really hope you don't get all three, and Karen totally agrees with me. <laughs> this was the presentation. Uh, we now do Q&A, so you can tweet at us, but you can also ask them on the YouTube live stream. First, we'll start with a question from the audience. Okay, no questions from the audience. Are there questions from YouTube? No questions? We got a lead. That is good. That's, I appreciate both questions and leads, but I think you appreciate leads even, even slightly more. Well, if that's the case, I want to thank everyone for watching. But now we'll keep staying on air and we'll do a live evaluation of what went right and wrong during this practice of our talk. So maybe you have all the presenters up here and then um, I'm not sure if Alex wants to join us. Alex, you want to join us? Cool. Come on up. Yeah, can we, I'll turn off mine and we can pass the mic. We can. And, uh, let's pretend we have a Q&A mic in the audience. I'll mute myself now. No. Uh, there it is. It's working. <laughs> Barbie encourages. Barbie encourages us to be publicly vulnerable during our executive offsite. So, check her. Cool. Uh, one mic is for the audience to give suggestions. Uh, my first question, is, I'm not sure who out there is the right person to answer it, um, but those people out there uh, on the stream watching, they may not see everything that's going to be uh, uh, presented in the next few days. When will it appear uh, uh, online so it could be uh, uh, on demand? Yeah, shortly following. Oh, the video or the deck? Joe, Joe, can you answer both? Yeah, so the, the video will be posted uh, probably within 24 hours after the event. Um, the team will make sure that the quality of the video is uh, good for everybody to be able to watch the replay. Um, the slides that were shared uh, today will be posted uh, to the viewers. Um, and then the, uh, the slides for tomorrow will be part of the um, blog post of the recap, which will include the video as well. 
Uh, so I don't have the exact time, so I just have to defer on that. Also, just to piggyback on that, with YouTube Live, you do have a DVR function. So let's say you just hopped onto the live stream and you missed something that just happened. You can always scroll backwards and, um, and pick that up. A lot of things we can do better. Uh, so one is the audio. So at the beginning of the session, there was an open mic. I think it was in the back of the room. So it was really hard to hear the speakers because you were hearing the shuffling of equipment as well as anybody speaking in the background. So we need to make sure that only the speaker's mic is hot when we go live. Uh, on a similar note, um, there's going to be a lot more people here tomorrow. And this was the dry run, and it all went pretty well. Um, we are going to want to post something outside that says turn your cell phones off, because we just don't need that happening here uh, during the actual presentation. Uh, we'll make sure to, we've got the mics on everyone that will be stuck to them. So it's going to be level to their um, Lo the loudness of their voice, so that should be leveled out by the end of the evening. We'll make sure to mention before the presentation starts that people should turn off their phones. Um, and we're going to be talking about either muting, unmuting microphones before going on or off the stage, or actually turning them off. I think the preference on our side is to mute and unmute. So it'll be turn on before they walk up on the stage, but I think it's good to talk with Alex and the audio technicians to nail that down to an exact science, maybe. Yeah, so tomorrow we're still firming up the plan with um, our awesome audio team, but basically um, I think the process that works really well is before you're going on stage or before you're speaking um, on stage, you'll kind of do a check-in. And so at that point, we'll turn you on and you'll know. And, um, and with regards to the earlier audio with um, hearing an open mic in the beginning in, in the back of the room, we were aware and uh, let us know tomorrow if there's anything like that, but there shouldn't be. But yeah, we'll, we'll basically, um, we'll check you before you are about to speak. When you come off the stage, we'll do the same thing. And, um, and then make sure that you're back on mute or we, you know, grabbing the mic pack from you. Yeah, I would say uh, three things on the transition, make them much faster. So hopefully we're right on the side here. Second, um, it can be longer, so energy or, or fluctuation in the voice. So if one person is talking for a long time, sometimes you become very monotone. Um, third thing is when you move around, our eyes change, and so I would have not just stand still, but kind of move around, engage the audience to the left, engage the audience to the right. Barbie, you've made really good eye contact, so I would do more of that. Um, it's easy to do because there's no eyes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but just move, move, use, the, use, the, use, the, use, the, use the stage. Yeah. Uh, use the stage, but try not to do Yeah, this. well, uh, I was thinking putting up some tape of where people can stand and not stand so they won't be in the camera view going up to the slide so you won't be interfering with what people are reading on the screen or the wall in this case. Um, make sure that you are aware. But when Yop was on, on the stage earlier and I was in the back, you could see the camera feet from that one in the pathway. You could actually see Yop's feet, so we might want to not do bright purple tape, for example. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe we could. Yeah. could I mean, even, even if you put it just barely right here, we would still get an indication. So that could be effective. It, I think it also mainly depends on like how far you go forward. So just I think it would be better just to put it on the floor exactly. Because the further you step towards the audience, the more you'll be in view of people being on the corner, for example. Mm -hmm. So what people usually do in this circumstance is they put a, an actual line with two endpoints. So you're, you're controlled both left and right and forward and back. Uh, yeah, yeah. With, the, with uh, respect to the monotoneness and things like that, um, I thought uh, uh, Yobi did a great job, very engaging. Um, and uh, you were the most um, uh, 
uh, interesting to listen to because of the you know the animation uh, that did that was very very good job on that. Um, there was something else too. Um, oh yeah, we um, it, possibly. It, I don't know if the batteries have been changed. Maybe that it'd be something that simple. Oh, okay. Perhaps a different oh. laptop where it's the USB port. Right. Yeah, let's, let's use an old school laptop. USB port. But I, that one I have an HDMI splitter first and second. Um, I know it's really old school and everybody likes to have the power of the clicker in their hand, but the best and most um, reliable way to change slides is simply to click the arrow on the physical laptop and um, it works every time. It's not Bluetooth, which can sometimes fail, especially when there's a lot of other transmissions going around the room. So that is a fail safe thing. And if somebody is manning that presentation laptop, they can just simply hit um, next when it's time. That's right. Oh. Let's try the old laptop with the splitter and then have Ernst on standby to yeah. hovering over the thing. Uh, a few a few other, well, you want to go first? Yeah, I said like if person, for example, use the remote and press and nothing happens, Ernst can just press a button. Um, usually people have other um, pre-programmed cues, a, a gesture of the hand or something like that that is recognized. Uh, uh, um, it, it does look, um, uh, uh, what would be the word, maybe um, uh, distracting when, when somebody keeps you know, messing with the, the remote. So if there's some kind of a, uh, a cue, like maybe you, you look back at the slide or something uh, in a certain way, then okay, that goes yeah. to the next slide. And, and, and that's a small hint for you who had a great presentation, but don't look back, look on the monitor here. I can't read the letters. Oh. Oh. Um, okay, keep looking at that thing, yeah. but make sure that Aaron says not flip. People on YouTube were complaining they couldn't see the complete slide. Yeah, oh. yeah that's something that we're going to be working out overnight, um, but they'll hopefully be very impressed with what they're looking at tomorrow, so we can bring those in. We'll do, a, we'll do the box in box and um, yeah, it, it looks simple, but it's impossible to, to focus a camera for a projection and a human in real life at the same time. So um, if you have a camera like that, please let us know. We'd like to buy them, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Uh, one more yeah, thing we, about- we don't care about today, we care about tomorrow. So one more thing about the transition when uh, the mic or the baton goes to the next person. Um, I, I normally see uh, uh, people reacting more like a team. Um, the transition happening off stage is not usually common, uh, but whoever's on stage, the other person comes all the way up, you fist bump, you know, thanks for coming up here, welcome. Um, it just looks, it looks more interesting uh, on camera. Very good. Apple style. Apple style, yeah. Yeah. Here, Chad, you can, you can practice. <laughs> Any more questions or comments out here? No? Any, any more suggestions? There's a microphone. This is the person in chat, everyone on YouTube. Thanks, no, thanks Richard. This is me uh, speaking. So sometimes you switch between the audio, who you're speaking to, whether it's the, the, the team or whether it's the wider audience. So just bear that in mind when you're sort of talking about the product and, and how good, great and great and good we are. So I, can I ask for clear, just to clarify, so you're saying that we should do more of that? We should direct ourselves towards the internet sometimes specifically or? I don't, I don't think it really matters. It's just you make it clear that you're talking about the team or you're talking about the product to the, to the customer base or the, the community rather than just okay. the team, if that makes sense. Cool. If there's no other things, we're going to go to dinner, possibly with a camera. <laughs>
Uh, no, no mic drops. We, we had those already. But uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Alex, for coming up stage. And thanks, Chad, for the awesome introduction. I was, uh, this was a great run, too. Uh, bro. My check, this mic's hot. Come on. Thanks. Uh, thanks for watching. Sorry for taking the stream down. Um, what we're going to try now is to, they're going to try to make a mobile camera ready, but we're still like inserting SIM cards in the thing. And then hopefully they can still catch us at dinner, but it might be too late. So we're going to give it a try for the next uh, 70 minutes. Um, until that time, it's going to be the super boring stream of this room. Sorry about that. Uh, from tomorrow on, we're going to try to be a better job and be on time and stream from 9 till 9. Thanks for joining. Bye. Awesome. That went out to two viewers. Did, did you uh, ju just for the presenters to know, I'm going to have uh, an extra mic 
for safety reasons. Let's hope we don't need it tomorrow. Uh, right next to you on the table, so we won't lose any time to for me to bring you another one if something happens. But let's hope the audio will be like the second half of the presentation. Thank you.